that I think can be uh, very helpful to all of us because it deals with something that we all have to confront uh, at uh, one time or another. Do you remember back when you first began listening uh, to the broadcast or first began receiving the literature, when you first began to come to an awareness that God was working in your life in a personal way, and God was dealing with you and bringing you to an understanding of certain things, and you came to a point of being convicted of God's truth, and you began making changes in your life. Maybe you quit working on Saturday, or you quit eating unclean foods, or you quit celebrating Christmas. You know, we all have certain memories. I One of my very vivid memories is the first Christmas I did not keep. And we made changes in our life based on the fact of conviction as to what God's Word said, as to what God's Word said. And our minds were opened, and we made commitments to God as we sought to understand God's Word, as we sought to come to grips with what we were learning. And there were promises that we made to God, and we were baptized. And as we look back on our lives, and in some cases that may be a number of years. I, I look out here and I see, you know, in a lot of cases, people who were baptized 20, 25, 30 years ago. A lot of years go by. And I think every one of us has to recognize that we have not always completely and totally lived up to what we intended at that time. You know, we read in the scriptures in the book of Genesis of a man by the name of Jacob. Jacob grew up, quote, in the church. His father, Isaac, had learned from his father Abraham. Now, Jacob wasn't a second generation, he was a third generation. And Jacob grew up knowing about God. And he knew about God's law, and he knew about God's truth, he knew about a lot of things. But if you go through and read the story of Jacob's life, it's very apparent, Jacob didn't really know God. He knew about God. He'd heard about God, been taught about God, learned various bits and information about God, but he didn't really know God in a very personal way. In fact, you can read the story, you know, as to how he tried to trick his old blind father and how he, uh, uh, you know, connived to beat his brother out of the birthright and various things. And you don't have to go very far before you realize, you know, Jacob really does, was not uh, a, a converted person. He did things that were not very nice. And, of course, as the story progressed, it all came out what he had done. And his brother Esau, who was even less converted than Jacob was, uh, at least in certain ways, maybe in a more outward way. Jacob was a little more subtle with some of his. Uh, Esau was mad, and Esau was ready to kill him. And Jacob's parents knew that. They knew at that point that Jacob needed to get out of there. The last thing they wanted was for one of the boys to kill the other. And, of course, they had been told back at the time when the boys were born, because they were twins, they had been told there was a prophecy made that the elder would serve the younger. And yet Esau, who was the elder, was always his father's favorite. And Isaac had somehow hoped that it would work out that Esau would inherit the birthright and the blessings. Even though he had known from the beginning that at the time of the birth, God had said that Jacob, the younger, would be the one who would inherit. So, evidently, Isaac had put off and had put off and had put off some of these things. Jacob got tired of waiting, connived around, tricked his father uh, Isaac recognizing that it really was God's purpose and will that was accomplished because of the prophecies made years ago, recognized that that was what should stand. So he called in Jacob, he and, his, uh, he and Rebekah called in Jacob and, and told Jacob to go back uh, to the land of their forebearers uh, to get a wife because they were in a different area inhabited by a totally uh, different group of people. And so he says, you go back to the land of the Chaldeans, you go back and get a wife of our people. And Jacob uh, arose and went, and he fled, really, because he was afraid that, I, that Esau was going to kill him. Now, if you remember the story, he fled, and when he got as far as he could get in a day's time, he found a place to spend the night. And he took a rock, and he arranged it, and made a, a pillow there where he could uh, uh, lie down, and try to make himself a bed. And while he was asleep, after he went to sleep, he had a dream. And this dream was so vivid, it was a vision. And he saw this great stairway leading up to heaven. And he saw angels ascending and descending up and down. And he saw this bright, brilliant light at the head of it. And a voice spoke to him and began to introduce himself. And you can read the story back in Genesis chapter 28. The Lord, verse 13 of 
Genesis 28, stood above and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, the God of Isaac, the land whereon you lie, to you will I give it into your seed. And your seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and shall spread abroad to the west and the east and the north, and to the south, and in you and in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. I'm with you. So, when Jacob, Jacob awakened, it scared him. Verse 16, he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. He was afraid. He says, This is the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. And he rose up early the next morning. He took the stone that he had set for his pillows, and he set it up for a pillar. And he poured oil upon the top of it, and he said the name of that place, he called the name of that place Bethel. It was originally called Luz, but he named it Bethel, which means the gate of God. And he vowed a vow, saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone, which I've set for a pillar, shall be God's house. And of all that you've given me, I will surely give the tenth unto you. Now, there's several things to notice here. Jacob sort of had a deal-making approach to God. You know, he this dream really shook him up. And he said, well, Lord, he said, I- I've got a deal for you. If you'll take care of me and watch over me, I'm scared to death. I'm afraid my brother's going to kill me. If you'll protect me, take care of me, bring me back home safely, then I'm going to get serious about religion. Then the Lord shall be my God. I'm going to really get serious about religion about that time. If you just get me back home safe, I, I've got to go. I've got a lot of things to do. I'm in a hurry. But you take care of me and get me back safely. I'm, I'm going to worship you. I'll start tithing. I'll do all this stuff. You know, cut a deal. Now, we find that Jacob went on his journey and he came to the, he came to the land of the people of the east. And he, of course, if you remember the story, he met up with his uncle, Laban. Laban was Rebecca's brother. Now, sometimes traits sort of run in a family. And some of the traits that Jacob had seem to have really been concentrated in his uncle Laban. Uh, the scripture doesn't say that Laban ran a used camel lot, uh, but uh, you know, they didn't have used cars back in those days. But if they sold used camels, Laban probably did, because he was a wheeler dealer. You go through and read the story, you know, Jacob wanted to marry his daughter, and he said, well, he says, that's fine. He says, work for me seven years. Uh, you know, I'll give you a room and board, and if you work for me seven years and do a good job, I'll give you my daughter. And Jacob loved her, and he did. And he woke up the next morning, and he realized that was not the one that he intended to marry. That was that was Leah. And he came tearing out of the tent, hunting for his father-in-law. And Laban said, oh, I thought you knew we got this custom in our country. You mean nobody told you? The oldest daughter always has to get married first. Oh, I thought for sure I told you I forgot. I tell you what, you want the other one? Have I got a deal for you? Seven more years and you can have. Now, they went through this. He worked, he worked 14 years. He had two wives and a bunch of kids and, 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 and nothing to show for it. See, he hadn't been paid any wages. All he'd gotten out of the deal was, 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 was room and board and, and, uh, Rachel and Leah. So Laban says, now, he says, I've got a deal for you. He says, you need to earn a living. You got, you're got you married to my daughters. He said, the time is up. But he said, why don't you stay on? You do a good job. Stay on. I'll pay you wages. And so they made a deal as to how they would divide out, you see. And it was not a money economy. It was primarily in cattle and sheep and goats and this, uh, things of this sort. So he, they made a deal as to how they would do it. And you go through the story and you find out that over the course of the next years, Laban changed the contract ten times. That's what it says a little bit uh, uh, later in in Genesis 31, 41. Thus have I been, uh, have I been twenty years in your house. I served you fourteen years for your two daughters and six years for your cattle, and you have changed my wages ten times. Ten times. Except the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had been with me, surely you would have sent me away now, empty. He says, you crook, you shyster, you try to beat me out of things, you change the contract. Every time I start making a little money, you go back and rewrite the contract. You change wages on me ten times, and if you, and if God hadn't blessed me, if God weren't looking out for me, you'd send me away broke. So, anyway, he left. And he went back, came back home. Uh, if you remember the story, you know, he came back and he heard that Esau uh, was, was coming to meet him. 
Now, this was not a joyous occasion, as, as, as it struck Jacob, because, you know, you've been away from home 20 years, and you come back and hear your brother's coming to see you. That normally ought to be good news. That was not good news to Jacob, because he remembered what Esau had told him when he left. I'm going to kill you. <laughs> and he knew Esau, having grown up with him, that Esau was not one to forget a fight. And so he was very nervous. And he'd come on down through the story and how... Uh, that uh, God wrestled with him in Genesis 32. And, uh, uh, you know, he uh, chapter 33, 1, he lifted up his eyes and he looked, and behold, Esau came, and with him 400 men. And uh, they, he was extremely nervous. And uh, uh, so, anyway, when he came on down, well, God had really worked a miracle because Esau did not try to kill him. They uh, sort of reconciled and went their separate ways. Well, Jacob comes on back and he lives in the land and time goes by. We're not told exactly how long, but a period of time, a period of years, a few years, goes by. And it seems like maybe Jacob had forgotten something. You see, there was a promise he had made to God years ago, but it was sort of like one of these foxhole conversions, you know. Uh, the, 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 the shells are whistling overhead and somebody is scared spitless and they're pro- making promises right and left. God, if you get me out of this, I'll never do that again. Of course, none of you have ever said a thing like that. Oh, God, if you just please get me out of this, I'll, I'll never, ever. Well, time had gone by and life had sort of settled out for Jacob. And Jacob was having family problems. He had sort of let things get in not too good a shape had not provided the leadership that he ought. And in Genesis chapter 35 and verse 1, God said unto Jacob, Arise and go up to Bethel. See, that's where they had started out all these years earlier. Go up to Bethel and dwell there, and make there an altar unto God, an altar unto God that appeared unto you when you fled from the face of Esau your brother. God appeared to him in a dream, and he said, Jacob, It seems like you and I had sort of an agreement. Now, I think I've kept my part of it. I've had mercy on you. I've watched after you. I've taken care of you. You've been back here in the land of your fathers, uh, back in your home area here now for several years. And it seems like to me that you made some promises. You've got some business to finish. You haven't really taken seriously what you said. You've allowed your commitments to slip. Jacob recognized the seriousness of what was involved. In verse 2, Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean, and change your garments. Now, Jacob had allowed his family members, his household, to have all these little idols that they had accumulated back in the land of the Chaldeans, and they had brought them with them. Jacob had allowed these things. He had allowed things to get in pretty bad shape. Jacob understood something. He understood that if he was going to renew his relationship with God, he had to start by making changes in his life. You know, a fundamental Protestant misconception was summed up in the old song that I remember singing in the Baptist church. Just as I am. Remember that one? Some of you came out of that sort of background. Just as I am. Well, I tell you, God doesn't want us just as we are. He wants us to repent. He wants us to change. We can't come to God and say, well, God, you know, if, uh, if what you see is what you get. I'm just going to come the way I am. I know you'll be satisfied with me just the way I am. No. Oh, God loved us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. That's right. It's not that we earn God's love or his mercy. But God extends his mercy toward us as a means and a basis by which we can change and be transformed to be renewed spiritually in the image of God. Jacob understood that if he was going to go back to Bethel, if he was going to renew a relationship with God, that he had to take seriously his commitments to obedience. And he said, Arise to his family. Put away all the strange gods that are among you and be clean. Verse 3, Let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make an altar unto God who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me in the way that I went. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods that were in their hand and all their earrings that were in their ears. Now, that's sort of an interesting thing. You find, if you go back to uh, uh, the book of Judges, that uh, 
This is basically talking about Jacob's sons, by the way, and I'll show you that here. Uh, you know, things had sort of gone to pot, a lot of worldly customs and ideas that were being practiced. This was uh, this uh, uh, the, the idea of uh, men uh, wearing earrings here was something that had originated uh, uh, in, uh, in Egypt, and the Ishmaelites were the ones that uh, did that in the Middle East. It was not something that uh, the others did so much. In fact, it was a trademark of the Ishmaelites. But, see, Jacob's family had sort of picked it up. Uh, back in Judges 8, 24, it mentions that Gideon said unto them, I would desire a request of you that you would give me every man the earrings of, the, of his prey, for they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. And so they gave them to him, and Gideon melted them down and made something else. But see, that was, that was the trademark of the Ishmaelites, but, you know, they were living there among some of these people, and Jacob's family wanted to blend in and be like everybody else. They wanted to look like them, act like them, do like them. So they had the strange gods and they were wearing the, the earrings. They were trying to blend in and be a part of the society of their day. Jacob said, give me this stuff. They gave to Jacob the strange gods that were in their hand and the earrings that were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak, which was by Shechem. And they journeyed and the terror of God was upon the cities that were round about them. And they didn't pursue after the sons of Jacob. And Jacob came to Luz, which is in the land of Canaan. That is Bethel, he and all the people that were with him. He built an altar called the name of the place El Bethel, Bethel, the God of the house of God, because there God had appeared to him when he fled from his brother. Now, Jacob gathered these things up before Jacob ever went back to Bethel. He dug a hole beside an oak tree, and he buried all this junk that they had accumulated. Jacob understood that if I'm going to go back to God and get on the right track, And I'm going to get my life straightened out and recommit myself to serve the living God. There's things that have to be left buried here under this oak tree in Shechem. We can't drag this stuff with us. All of these things that we've accumulated, all the strange gods that we've picked up along the way. You can't take the world with you to renew your commitment to God. Jacob came back to Bethel to renew a vow, to renew a commitment. There was a time of crisis in Jacob's life, and he had made promises to God, and undoubtedly when he made them, he meant them, but time went by. Life went on. Jacob had his ups and downs. He learned lessons. God dealt with him. Life sort of smoothed out. Problems arose. The time came when God said to Jacob, Jacob, it's time for you to get down to business. You made a promise to me. You made a vow. You made a commitment. It's time to arise and go up to Bethel. You need to renew that relationship. And brethren, we all go through times when we have to renew that relationship. When we have to understand the importance of arising and going up to Bethel. The Bethel in our life. But if and when you're going to arise and go up to Bethel, there are things that have to be buried under the oak tree before you leave. Because you see, God doesn't call us to come just as we are. God says, be clean. You know, Jacob, they went through it from a physical standpoint. He told them all, he says, be clean and change your garments. They did it physically as a symbol of what was to take place spiritually. We've got to be clean. We've got to put on the garments of righteousness. We've got to make changes in our life. It's not enough to simply know the truth. It's not enough to simply be right on some technical point of doctrine. It's not enough to know something that somebody else doesn't know. The real issue is what are we doing with what we know? Is it changing and transforming our lives? Because the knowledge of God and God's way is intended to be transforming knowledge. It's intending, it's intended to be knowledge that will change and transform and remake us. It's important that we understand what was involved because it is a point that, to which we all must come in our life. Now we look at the things that beset us and the things that sometimes bog us down, the things that get us sidetracked from the commitments we made, from the intentions that we had. I want to focus in in the remaining portion of the sermon on some keys, some things that are involved in being a genuine overcomer. How are we going to grow? We find ourselves sometimes, just as Jacob was, bogged down. Having started out with high hopes and good intentions, Somehow having gotten sidetracked and things aren't quite what they ought to be. We've accumulated some things along the way. How do you genuinely change and overcome? How do we follow through? 
You know, we're reminded back in Romans chapter 8 and verse 13, if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if through the Spirit you do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Through the Spirit you mortify, you put to death. You put an end to the deeds of the flesh. We've got to put a stop to the deeds of the flesh. We have to be led by the Spirit of God if we're to be the sons of God. Now, to be led by means that we voluntarily follow. That we are following where the Spirit of God is leading. That is crucial and that's important. Let's go on. Let's understand a little further. How do you mortify the deeds of the flesh? Well, we're going to talk about that in a moment. Let's go back to the book of James. James chapter 1, verse 13. Let no man say, when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempts he any man. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. We're drawn away of our own lust and enticed. Then when lust is conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. There is a progression. There is a progression that takes place. God's not out trying to trip us up, trying to see us, trying to make us fall. No, we're tempted when we're drawn of our own desires. We're pulled in a certain direction. We're enticed. You know, we were talking earlier at supper, people were talking about fishing. You know, what, what is a, what's, a, what's the purpose of a lure? Why do they call it a lure? Because it's supposed to lure the fish, right? It's supposed to entice them and attract them. And the fish doesn't go looking for a hook. He goes looking for a nice big juicy bug or worm or something. He's looking for supper. He's sort of licking his lips. The fish had lips. And if they had something to lick them with, he's, he's enticed. It looks good. What he doesn't realize is there's a hook, maybe two or three, that are all hidden in there. And he chomps on what he thinks is going to be dessert, and he gets a mouthful. And now he's all of a sudden pulled into a spot where he had not really anticipated being. Now it says here that we're tempted when we're drawn away of our own lust, our own desires, and we're enticed. We're pulled in a certain direction, a certain bait is sort of dangled out there, and it looks good, and we're pursuing it. And it leads us somewhere we hadn't intended to be, because you see, when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin. You see, the desire, when that's thought about and cultivated and sort of turned over and looked at and held on to, the desire gives rise to the action, and the action produces the consequence. Lust when it conceives, brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. You see, the ideas have consequences. Ideas lead to actions which lead to results. Lust produces sin, which produces death. Now, we're told on down a little further, as we come on down here, James talks about that, in verse 18, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. That's why God has begotten us as his children, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Unfortunately, many times people are swift to speak and slow to hear. I sort of get that verse back. I, I've always figured that the fact that uh, God gave us two ears and one mouth uh, maybe is an indication of something. You know, he didn't give us two mouths and one ear. Uh, maybe he wants us to listen twice as much as we, uh, you know, to hear twice as much as what we, we say. It's amazing how we tend to get in more trouble when we're speaking than when we're listening. So he says, be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man works not the righteousness of God. When you get upset, get all stirred up and go charging off half cock, that doesn't produce the righteousness of God. generally produces something to repent of. So God says there are things to go slow on. Verse 21, wherefore, lay apart, get rid of all filthiness, all excess of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Be you doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. The New, King, the New English Bible renders this, verse 21, Away then with all that is sordid and the malice that hurries to excess, and quietly accept the message planted in your hearts that can bring you salvation. So the fact that the, there are changes that are to be made, we have to lay apart. We have to lay aside like taking off an old, uh, an old garment, like getting, you know, getting undressed or changing clothes. We lay apart, lay aside the filthiness, all of the things that lead to the wrong things. And with meekness, with humility, 
We receive the engrafted word. What is added on, added in, what is made a part of us. The word of God is then implanted. It has to be thought. And it's implanted into us. God implants his nature. Now let's go a little further. In terms of genuine change. Because that's really what we have to be after is, is genuine change. Change that is real. Change that is from the heart. Notice what Christ said in Matthew 15. Matthew 15, verse 11. Now Christ was answering Pharisees. They were not discussing clean and unclean meats, as some seem to have gotten confused. The issue had to do with eating their bread with unwashed hands, Matthew 15, 2. had nothing whatsoever to do with going out and uh, eating a ham sandwich. It, it uh, had to do with the tradition of the Pharisees, and they, the whole issue, again, was not just a matter of being sanitary. The Pharisees viewed that all the people with whom they came in contact were sinners, and they would be defiled by that. And before they would touch food that would go in their mouth, they went through this big elaborate ritual of washing their hands up to their elbows because they had been walking and they may have touched a sinner. And they were contaminated and they made this big production because they were better, they were holier than anyone else. And then they noticed that Christ and his disciples didn't make this big production. They were walking through the grain field, got some grain and popped it in their mouth. And they were shocked. And Christ then tell, told them in verse 11, of Matthew 15. Not that which goes into the mouth defiles a man. That's not what makes you unclean, is putting uh, something in, in your mouth that uh, uh, you had not uh, washed your hands and somehow you this was going to ceremonially defile you. You'd be cut off from God. Not that which goes into the mouth defiles a man, but that which comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. Then came his disciples unto him and said, You know, I think the Pharisees were offended when they heard what you said. And he answered and said, Every plant that my father has not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone. That's the solution to a lot of things, you know. Uh, somebody here, the Pharisees, were all stirring up difficulty. And he said, Let them alone. They're blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall in the ditch. And then answered Peter and said, Declare unto us this parable. And he said, Are you also yet without understanding? Don't you yet understand that whatsoever enters in at the mouth goes into the belly and is cast out into the draught? Those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands defiles not a man. Again, I make the point that the issue was unwashed hands. It had nothing whatsoever to do with clean and unclean meats. That was not even the subject. The issue was ceremonially washing the hands. And whether or not the failure to do so put you in a defiled category excluded from the presence of God. And the issue was a tradition of the elders. It was not a commandment of God, because you see, that's what uh, the Pharisees had asked him in chapter 15, verse 2. Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? And he said, why do you transgress the commandments of God by your tradition? Christ was not advocating transgressing the commandments. He was talking about... Uh, human traditions, and he was making a point. He said, real defilement, what separates us from God, what renders us unclean spiritually, originates on the inside of the person. You see, here's the key. The most fundamental issue in overcoming has to start on the inside. You see, there are people who've made changes, and they have simply started on the outside. They have conformed. They have fit in. Oh, we're not supposed to eat that? Fine, they didn't eat that. Not supposed to, to do this, not supposed to, to do that. You don't, uh, uh, you know, whatever it is. Uh, well, they, they conform to a set of rules. And then they have started doing things and stopped doing things because they wanted to fit in with a group of people and they conform to the rules. That's not what he's talking about here. He says, look, out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts. Out of the innermost being. The starting place, if we're going to genu genuinely overcome, if we're going to grow and go forward and fulfill the commitment that we made to God, it's got to start on the inside. The change has got to be from the inside out. From the inside out. Because he said that which proceeds out of the heart. This is what defiles. This is what cuts off and alienates from God. See, the psalmist says back in Psalm 19.14, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. 
The words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, what I think about on the inside, because you know, brethren, sooner or later what we're thinking about on the inside is going to come spilling out on the outside. So we have to ask God, Don't not, it's not enough to let my actions be okay. It's not even enough to let my words be okay. What he said was, let the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. I want to come to the point where what I think about is pleasing to God. If what I think about is pleasing to God, then the words that come out of my mouth are going to proceed from my thoughts, and they'll be pleasing, and the actions that come out will be pleasing because they will proceed from my thoughts. You see, sin starts in the mind, and so does righteousness. So does righteousness. It starts in the heart and in the mind. Psalm 37. Psalm 37 and verse 31. We're told here, it says, that The law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. The law of his God is in his heart. It's not just something written on a piece of paper somewhere. It's not simply something contained on a plaque. It's in his heart. It's something he's making a part of himself because he's studying it, he's reading it, he's meditating on it. He's thinking about it. He's trying to put it to work in his life. On over a couple of pages in, in Psalm 40, verse 8. I delight to do your will, O my God. Yes, your law is within my heart. See, there's a contrast here. The law is in the heart. A matter of, as it, as it says, we're going to see here in, in Psalm 119, it says, Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against you. Brings that out. Uh, back in verse 11 of Psalm 119, your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. We read God's word, we think about God's word, we meditate on God's word. It becomes a part of us. It becomes something we're thinking about, something, a set of values that we've embraced and it's going to reflect itself. See, it's a total contrast to what it describes in, in, Psalm, in Psalm 41 and verse 6. If you come to see me, he speaks vanity. His heart gathers iniquity to itself. When he goes abroad, he tells it. Oh, so he, instead of gathering righteousness and gathering the law to be hidden in our hearts, it says here in Psalm 41, 6, speaks of certain individuals whose hearts gather iniquity to them, to itself. They think about all sorts of plots and schemes. They are thinking about the wrong things. You know, David said in Psalm 51, in verse 10, he says, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. David understood that the real key to making a change in his life started on the inside. Create in me a clean heart. God's word has to be there. God's truth has to be there. We're to have a clean heart within us. A heart that is renewed. A heart in which God's word is hidden. Well, we're told in Psalm 95 in verse 8, Harden not your heart is in the provocation. As in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, saw my works forty years, forty ye saw my works forty years long was I grieved with this generation and said, It is a people that do err in their hearts. They've not known my ways. You see, when God brought Israel out of Egypt, they never left Egypt in their heart. They never left it in their heart. In their heart they did not forsake Egypt. They left with their feet. And their heart always looked back. They looked back longingly. You know, somebody is turned around, turning around and going back into the world. They never left in their heart. They never left the world in their heart if they're going back in their actions. Because if they had forsaken it in their heart, they wouldn't be going back to it. We're told in Hebrews 11 that by faith Moses forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, but seeing him who is invisible. By faith he forsook Egypt. He turned his back on what was there. You see, forsaking takes place in our heart, in our mind. Jacob had gone along with certain things. But you see, he and his family had not forsaken the world until he came to grips with the covenant that he had made with God. And the fact that he himself had compromised in his heart and in his mind. And he had let little things slide here and there. And it had accumulated until he had so much stuff that he had to dig a trench to bury it all before he could go back and renew his covenant with God. Overcoming, changing, starts in the heart and in the mind. Oh, it involves the actions all right. I'm not diminishing the importance of what we do. But you know, it's sort of the difference. If you've got weeds in your yard, you know, a lot of times in the spring, weeds in the yard, 
run along, moreover, you can mow all the weeds and all the grass and it all looks fine for a short time. That's not very long before you notice the weeds are still there. See, they just come back. If you don't, if you're going to get rid of them, you've got to kill the root. You can mow it all off. And then, see, that's what people do sometimes with sheer willpower. They sort of mow it all off. They, they, things look okay for a while. They're able to hold it together. But if we don't get to the root of the problem, if we don't get to the spiritual root, I guarantee you the problems always continue to crop up. If we don't get at the spiritual root, people who, you know, in, in terms of, tra- of being transformed, being uh, changing, we, we've got to come to grips with that. Let's go back to Colossians 3. Colossians 3, we'll start here in verse 1. Before we do, though, I want to uh, read you something out of the 141st Psalm. Sort of finishes up this thought that we've been going through in terms of, of the change of heart. Because that's really where change starts, is, is it has to start in the heart. And notice what, he's, what, what uh, David says in, in the 141st Psalm. Verse 3 he says, Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. Incline not my heart to any evil thing, to practice wicked works with men that work iniquity. Let me not eat of their dainties. Set a watch. Set a guard at my mouth. Don't let anything escape that shouldn't be there. Keep the door of my lips. How often do we ask God to set an armed guard there at our mouth and make sure nothing escapes that shouldn't come out? He said, incline not my heart to any evil thing. See, that's the key. Ultimately, the key to keeping the wrong things from coming out of the mouth is David asked God, he said, help me not to be inclined in my heart toward evil things, toward the things that should not be. I don't want to eat of their dainties. I don't want to take in their little juicy tidbits. Now, Paul lays out in Colossians, I'm going to lay it out specifically as seven steps. The first one is laid out right here, verse 1. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. The starting point to overcome, to making good on our commitment to God, the starting point is in our affection. We're never going to turn loose of something that we cherish. And we're never going to hold on to something that we lightly esteem. If we don't love the truth, we're not going to hold on to it. Set your affection on things above. You see, the starting point to change, the starting point to really really changing is where are our affections set? What's important to us? We're told that Abraham and the others... We're told that Abraham looked for a city that has foundations, whose maker and builder is God. Abraham left Ur of the Chaldeans. That's up the river a little bit from Babel. Babylon was the capital of the Chaldeans. The land of the Chaldeans, that was Babylon. Great Babylon, the city that Nimrod built. Abraham turned his back on the city that Nimrod built. And he looked for a city whose maker and builder is God. He set his affections on things above. And Abraham didn't look back. Moses didn't look back to Egypt. You see, the first key is you've got to set your affection on things above. If this world and what it has to offer is the most important thing to you, you'll never turn your back on it. Our affection, what we really value, what we love most of all, if it is not the calling of God, the promises of God, the kingdom of God, being born into God's family. If that does not come first before all, then we're never going to follow through on our calling. We've got to seek those things that are above. We've got to set our affection on the things that are above, not on things on the earth. It's a matter of loyalty, allegiance, devotion, love. The second thing we have to do, verse 3, For you're dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall you appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience, in which you also walked some time when you lived in them. Mortify. It means put to death. Now, if you're going to put something to death, you're going to have to poison it, you're going to have to choke it, uh, you're going to have to deprive it of those things that enable it to live and flourish. If you're going to kill a plant, you've got to deprive it of those things that sustain its life. If you're going to kill an animal, you've got to deprive it of those things that, kill it, that, that sustain its life. If you're going to kill anything, you have to deprive it of that which is life-sustaining. If you're going to mortify the things 
the wrong actions. Then what does that mean? That means you've got to starve off the things that feed those wrong actions. See, starts out fornication, uncleanness. How, how, do you, how do you put that to death? Well, you starve it out, you choke it out. You don't feed it with reading, you know, dirty magazines or watching, uh, you know, lust inciting uh, television or whatever it may be. If you're trying to choke out immorality, if you're trying to put that to death, you don't feed it. You don't feed it the things that cause it to flourish and bloom and blossom. If you're going to put it to death, you got to choke it out. you got to deprive it of the things that would feed it. You know, people feed so often in entertainment, whether it's music, literature, uh, drama, whatever it may be, They what they're feeding in are things that feed attitudes of, of violence and lust. You can't put to death those things while you're inciting and inflaming uh, those passions. Mortify them, put them to death. You see, the starting point is with our affections. Where do we set our affections? The second thing is what do we do? Do we, do, do we take action to choke out sin, to deprive of that which gives life and causes to flourish the sins of the flesh? Thirdly, we're told in verse 8 that we have to put off anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. We've got to get rid of certain things. You, you set your affections above. You choke out, starve out certain feelings and attitudes by not feeding them. You put off, you get rid of, you lay aside certain wrong actions. Then we're told in verse 10 that we put on right actions. You put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. You see, it starts with our affection, proceeds on to what we feed our mind, then we start putting off certain actions, putting on other actions. Then, you see, you put on bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. We put on certain things, and then we're told, what do we need to do? Verse 13, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. So, you see, our relationship with one another is to be transformed by an attitude of forbearing and forgiving. It's amazing what that will do. It's an attitude. It's an approach. Forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. The realization that we need to reflect in our dealings with others how God has dealt with us. Then we're told in verse 15, Let the peace of God rule in your heart, through which you're called in one body, and be you thankful. There's a peace of mind that comes as a result of being thankful. There's a peace. Not a peace that's simply derived from the around, but a peace that is derived from the above. And the thing that enables us to key into that peace is an attitude of thanksgiving. Being thankful. Being appreciative. Counting our blessings. You know, the people who just count their troubles. Count their problems. They count all the things. They, they count everything negative, And they somehow don't find time to give God thanks for the blessings. God's peace will rule in our heart. It will dominate, it will control when we have turned things over to him and we're thankful and appreciative. And finally, verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Let God's word dwell in you. If we want to genuinely overcome and follow through on the commitment that we make, you know, there's a time to renew that. There's a time to examine what we're doing, to realize that there are things we've got to get rid of, we've got to bury under the oak tree, and we've got to go up to God to renew that commitment, realizing the importance of making changes, that we don't come just as we are. Those changes have to start in the heart. It's not enough just to, to say, well, I'm going to do better. Real change, real growth, real overcoming originates in our heart and in our mind. And if we're going to implement that, then we start by setting our affections above, having our, our loyalty, our love, our allegiance focused on the things of God, choking out and starving out the sins that so easily beset us by not feeding them, getting rid of the wrong actions, putting on the right actions, valuing forbearance and forgiveness, being thankful and letting the peace of God as a result of that thankfulness rule in our hearts and letting God's Word dwell in us by studying it, reading it, putting God's Word in our minds. If it is our meditation, if that's what is our thinking, you see, it brings us back around full circle because real 
change, permanent change. The kinds of change that last are changes that start in the heart and mind. Brethren, we can't ever afford to take lightly and casually our call. We've got to deeply value what God has called us to do. God has given us the treasure of his Holy Spirit to change and to transform us. You know, on our own, we don't have what we're all, what we are. As a matter of fact, we're told that, you know, we have this treasure that God has given us, this spirit of his. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. We're frail, fragile human beings. But we have access to the spirit of God. To the, that is a renewing spirit. That is a spirit that empowers us. And ultimately, where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Real liberty. Not the false liberty that leads to captivity to sin, but liberty from sin and its consequences. Jacob had to come to a point in his life when he had to face up to the fact that in spite of all of his good intentions, in spite of, in spite of all of his high hopes, he had not really followed through on his commitment with God. Jacob came to a point in his life where he made some changes. He went before God and he renewed that covenant. And he recognized the need to make changes accompanied that renewal. Brethren, any time we're to come to renewal in our life, it's got to be accompanied by change if it's going to last. And if it's going to last, the change with which it must be accompanied is change that begins on the inside. It's change that comes from the inside out.